The forces of nature are continually at work in leveling landforms. Even mountains, if given a long enough time, will be reduced to flat plains. The process is slow, but is going on this very second, changing the surface of our land. The most important elements of erosion are wind, water, and gravity. These forces work together to carve valleys through mountains and deep gorges through plains. The combined action of wind, water, and gravity move more material than man has ever dreamed, even with his largest and most powerful machines. Running water is perhaps one of the fastest agents of erosion. Maybe you can remember a raging stream after a heavy rain. It is often muddy because it carries with it a large quantity of soil which was carried into the river by smaller streams. Running water can cut through even the hardest rock. Small bits of rock carried in the water help to grind away the rock beneath it. But once the river has reached bedrock, the process becomes slower. Gravity pulls down water to the lowest level possible. Most rivers are above sea level, and so they flow down to the sea. Some rivers flow more quickly than others because they are higher and move to sea level in a shorter distance. All streams have a gradient. Gradient is determined by finding the amount of decrease in a given length of a river. Let us take, for example, a river which is 10 miles long. The difference in elevation from the highest point, its origin, to the lowest point, or sea level, is 10 feet. Therefore, the gradient of the river is 10 feet in 10 miles, or one foot per mile. Running water carries with it quantities of sand, which grind away the land as it passes over it. This suspended material comes from sand, silt, and clay, as well as other pebbles which find their way into the water. In mountainous areas, runoff water from glaciers may contain fine white sediment known as glacial milk. If a small sample of water were dried, a fine powder would be found. This material is a clay-like substance, and it is found to be ground granite. In the spring, when meltwater is extremely high, great amounts of hard material are worn down and carried away. While weathering and erosion of rocks is taking place, the actual movement or transport takes place only in running water. In dry climates, sudden thunderstorms can erode away the surface very quickly. Rocks expand in the sun's heat. In the night, they cool and shrink. This constant expanding and shrinking weakens the rocks and causes them to break down. Loose material gathers until a heavy rainstorm and then the material is carried away. It is this action that has been most responsible for the shape of the American Southwest. Thousands of years ago, when the Colorado River swelled to carry off the meltwater from the glaciers and the Rockies, it carved many deep canyons. When temperatures rose to melt the glaciers, tremendous rivers carried the water to the Pacific Ocean. These swollen rivers ground out thousands of cubic miles of sedimentary rock, which had been laid down millions of years before by oceans which covered this part of the world. Massive cliffs were left exposed after the glaciers melted, and the rivers returned to their normal channels. Our western states, such as Utah, Arizona, and Colorado, exhibit numerous areas where canyons have been formed by the turbulent water. Water would often be diverted into these areas and would get trapped. They would swirl around and carve out more rock. When the rivers receded, they left many box canyons. More resistant rock held up to the erosional force 
and formed small buttes, as seen in the Colorado National Monument, located in western Colorado near the Utah border. Because some rock is harder than others, it did not even wear away as fast, and so we have these spectacular erosional features remaining. Millions of years of geologic history can be traced in the layers of rock cut by the winding rivers. The most spectacular gorge in the world is found in Arizona. It is the Grand Canyon, which was formed by the mighty Colorado River. Now a national park, it is over a mile deep as it winds through sediment and rock almost as old as the earth itself. The river has slowed now after it has cut through 5,000 feet of sediments. The 200-mile canyon is filled with many meanders, which were formed when the river eroded through softer material and then was trapped between the hard sides of the canyon. This spectacular gorge is still deepening and widening from the forces of wind, water, and gravity. Erosion breaks rock into smaller pieces which are carried to the sea by the river. Rocks in the arid desert region wear away with each rainstorm. Exposed rock masses are weathered to form soil and broken rock. Vegetation delays runoff materials, but in the desert there is very little vegetation, so there is more rapid erosion. Sand is carried into streams and is eventually carried to the ocean. Surface rock is greatly subjected to erosional forces of wind and water. Freezing temperatures at night and baking temperatures during the day cause the rock to expand and contract. Eventually, this causes the rock to weaken and crack along an area of fatigue. In a stream, swirling waters can come into contact with less resistant rock to form large potholes. Small stones and pebbles grind away at the side of the holes to increase their size. Here we see layers of sandstone with potholes caused by the rushing waters. Sandstone is rather soft and therefore it erodes very easily. Grains of sand which make up sandstone are cemented together easily. Swirling waters scour the bottom with small rock until both are smooth and rounded. Even harder rocks, such as quartzite, which is sandstone that has been hardened by pressure and heat, can be eroded by running water. The process will take longer, but erosion will be evident. Water can cut very deep into rock, such as this waterfall. The process may take hundreds of years, but slowly the rock is broken down. Another important erosional force is the wind. Perhaps you never considered the wind as a destructional or tearing down force, but it does play an important role. Wind carries rock particles along the Earth's surface. Maybe you have had sand blown in your eyes during a sudden gust of wind. Wind erosion smooths the sandstone. Wind eroded features are quite common in our western states where dry climates and open areas are ideal conditions for these processes to take place. The actual erosional process is simple. Sand grains or small rock particles are carried by the wind and hit the exposed rock with some force. This sand blasting effect breaks down surface rock and smooths it. Unusual formations may result, such as this arch. The wind-carried particles are continually weakening the structure until it becomes very thin. Arches and natural bridges are a rather uncommon erosional feature. Probably many arches have been formed in the past, but were eventually worn down so thin that they crashed to the ground below them. Gravity 
the attraction of all objects to the Earth's center also plays a role in erosion. In this case, small particles or larger rocks break off and smash rocks below as they fall. The combined action of wind and water is also responsible for an unusual erosional feature called exfoliation. Most rock contains tiny cracks, which were the result of weakened bonding between crystals. Repeated expanding and shrieking of the rock caused these minute features. Water then seeped into the cracks, expanded, and froze to cause great internal pressures within the rock. The rock is broken off in layers. More and more layers are exposed and the process is repeated. The result is called a domed mountain, rounded surfaces which usually occur with granite rock. Here we see layering in the granite. These layers are quite different from those found in sedimentary rocks such as sandstone or limestone. Granite is an igneous rock, rock that was once molten and allowed to cool and crystallize. The layering we see here was formed by the erosional process, exfoliation. We spoke of gravity earlier and said that it too plays an important part in changing the surface of the land. Shrinking and expanding of the rock masses weaken the structure until large pieces break off. These pieces of rock fall and collect at the bottom of mountains. They are called talus slopes. A closer view shows unconsolidated material which may one day be hardened together into a breccia conglomerate. The edges are rough and sharp. This is a good way to tell a breccia. If the rock contained rounded pebbles, it was probably formed near an ancient stream bed where running water had smoothed the stones. Plants also play a very important part in erosion. They help to break down the surface until topsoil occurs, and then other life forms move in, which in turn break down rock even more. Roots find their way into the small cracks and force open rocks to expose more surface area and to speed up erosion. Roots also produce carbon dioxide, which mixes with water to form carbonic acid. This weak acid helps to break down rock even further. One of the most spectacular places on the North American continent to witness the process of weathering and erosion is at Bryce Canyon National Park located in southern Utah. The great wilderness areas of southern Utah contain some of the most varied and unusual scenery found anywhere in the world. High snow-capped peaks, timbered mesas, mountain meadows carpeted by wildflowers, deep colorful canyons, and hot arid deserts can be found side by side. Bryce Canyon National Park is set in the middle of this peculiar country. The events that shaped Bryce Canyon began with the deposition of the pink rock layers from which the delicately colored spires and pinnacles are carved in the early Eocene age of geological time, approximately 60 million years ago. Even then, eons had already passed. High mountains had developed in the American West several times, only to be eroded away. In ancient lowlands, layer upon layer of sediments had been deposited, testifying to the many different environments which succeeded one another. Rocks of these earlier ages today make up the walls of the Grand Canyon and the colorful cliffs of Zion National Park. These rocks are present in the Bryce Canyon area but here they are buried deep beneath the surface of the plateau. The canyons and lower lying hills surrounding the Bryce Canyon area are cut from gray, white and tan shales and sands which were put down by the last ocean to cover southern Utah 
about 120 million years ago. It is upon this astonishing geological sequence that we raise the curtain of our story on Bryce Canyon. At the beginning of the Eocene age, powerful forces within the Earth caused movement and change in the Earth's crust. The region of Bryce Canyon remained more stable than areas to the west, south, and east, which were thrust slightly higher. As the forces of erosion went to work, destroying these higher hills, the streams and rivers carried material into the lower-lying basin. These watercourses emptied, not into an ocean, but into huge lakes which occupied the central lowlands. Entering the lakes, stream waters slowed abruptly in flow and dropped their burdens of sand and mud in deltas and on sandbars. The work of the erosion and deposition continued steadily, relentlessly for many centuries until hundreds of feet of sediments were laid down over much of the low-lying basin. Eventually, the lakes disappeared. However, streams still occupied much of the area. These streams left small rounded pebbles which formed the conglomerate beds just above the Wasatch Formation. This thin conglomerate is found today only at the top of Bryce Point and capping two high mesas near the northern boundary of Bryce Canyon National Park. Erosion never stops. When the earth forces lift an area, erosion immediately attacks and begins to tear the land away. As southern Utah was raised, it was also eroded. The rivers and streams tore away some of the lavas almost as soon as they were deposited. They tore away much of the conglomerates above the Wasatch. They have cut deep canyons carrying away many cubic miles of material and exposing layer after layer of rock. The Wasatch Formation, being among the youngest rock layers, stands high on the highest mesas in southern Utah and gives us much of the spectacular color that dominates the scenery. One of the primary reasons for Bryce Canyon National Park being set aside was to preserve the fantastic spires and pinnacles that have been created as the Wasatch Formation has been eroded. This erosion has been accomplished almost entirely by water. The layers of the Wasatch Formation are of different hardnesses. Therefore, when the waters attack, the softer material is taken away faster. The erosion of these thin layers of different resistance is responsible for the bizarre shapes and forms. Often we find deep and narrow canyons within the Wasatch Formation. Vertical cracks that developed within the formation were points of weakness that the waters found easy to erode. With the passage of time, running water enlarged these features, leaving canyons separated by thin walls. The erosion is still going on today at what seems like almost visible rates. Sometimes some of the higher pinnacles or castles are eroded so much that they eventually collapse. While some are destroyed, others are being cut out of the face of the plateau. A constant building and destruction process is going on right before our eyes.